Greetings. My name's Ross. I made this film to introduce you to my friend, Patrick Gracewood, and his art. When I met Patrick, we were both students at Portland Community College. I was a multimedia lab tech. How can I help? And he asked me to help him with a project. We struck up a conversation about art, and Patrick invited me to visit his studio. My name is Patrick Gracewood. I'm an artist and professional sculptor. My earliest memory of making sculpture was I dug up some clay in the backyard and made a little tiny figure about maybe three inches because I was a child. And I stuck it in the garage and I found it years later. It was kind of a personal archeology. span I didn't get my glasses till I was in high school. No one knew I was legally blind. They just thought I was stupid. So just to be able to see the world dimensionally, I remember just being dazzled by seeing the leaves on trees and just walking around a tree and watching the whole thing shift in perspective. That living in a dimensional world has never left me. I love that. And I specialize in bas relief work, which is the half-life between something very flat and something fully dimensional. And in that tiny space, you can create tremendous depth. When I asked Patrick who I should talk to for insight on him and his art, he introduced me to Robin Smith, who he met at Long Beach State College. They've been fast friends ever since. Robin was stoked to talk with me about her friendship with Patrick and what she knows about his art. I was fortunate to meet Patrick in school at Long Beach State University in the early 70s. I remember a tall man, he was always laughing and smiling. From the first piece that I ever saw of Patrick's work, it was filled with science, history, innuendo, double entendre. There was always something about it that was funny. I don't think that he can stand to be serious about everything. Patrick's like Michelangelo. He can bring something up off of a page and you can touch it. He is so skilled. You know, it's funny because he knows it, but he doesn't know it. People who have innate raw talent, it's just the way they are. They don't get that <laughs> they're on another planet. And Patrick's on another planet, has always been on another planet. In college, a friend sent me a book of a Japanese sculptor who lived in the 1500s named Enku. He was an itinerant Buddhist monk, and he swore to carve 100,000 Buddhas before he died. And they're still finding caches of hundreds of his work in a, in a humid culture where things don't last that long. Because of his vow, he had to work fast rather than, you know, nuance and detail, so they're very direct. And that changed my idea of how to work with wood. And now that I'm working in Doug fir, it is a very low resolution material, so I have to be very direct. The nature of wood to me is really meaningful. I'm a gardener, I love the natural living world, so it's a pun. I have flowers and greenery in my work, and it's all made out of wood. I see wood as a collaborator with me. I'm not forcing an idea onto it. I look and I use and encourage the natural flaws of a wood. It wants to split, it wants to age, crack, splinter. And I bring that out as nothing else will do that, no other material. My current series of work uses reclaimed construction debris. It's dug fir, it's a crappy wood, it's impossible to get detail. It fights me every step of the way. I hate it, but nothing else gives me the way this wood looks. All of this work really explores the nature of wood. What is it? What does it want to do by itself? And then I'm asking it to come along into my ideas, so I use it. If I do my part, it becomes whatever I ask of it. It's just magic. It can be feathers, it can be 
ferns. It, it turns into whatever I ask it, including laugh lines. I'm using end grain dug fir. Instead of starting from the outside of a log and working in, I can start from the center, the very heart of a tree, and work out. And so that blooms outward, and I'm drawing with the, an the annular growth rings of the tree. So I compose from my drawings to using the actual tree to draw with, and then I carve to make it dimensional. The wood, once I've carved it, is very crude. The wood does not take refinement. Then I will torch it, which feels really fun because after battling this wood, then I get to set it on fire. What, how, that's a hoot. And what that does is it softens some of the directness and it also ages the wood physically because it really stresses it and it brings out the annular growth rings that emphasize the movement of the sculpture. It's almost like a cartoon animation where a figure is moving and there's all this, the arc of a, a movement in the wood itself and in the surrounding wood. I don't believe that Patrick and I ever thought at that time during school, although we were desperate to make money because we had to live, but art wasn't that. Art was never about money. Art was about time. Art was about your place in the universe. Art was about some kind of statement that didn't have to be about politics. It had to be more timely with our, some inner clock that you have, some date with something in the future that you didn't know about yet, but that you were eking along to get to that spot because you know, you're blind at that. Time. You don't know. And it isn't clear that we know now, but we have a better idea. We would do anything for art. And then after that, you know, you have to start negotiating for money. <laughs> a huge turning point a while ago, the company I'd worked for went belly up and I took it personally. I was like, I've been through four or five industries and I kept saying, what the hell do I do now? And I said it once too often and started laughing because that, what the hell do I do? is basic question of middle age. It's a question of life. What the hell do I do now? And I wrote a manifesto. And it, in order to do that, I had to go, what have I done my whole working life? I get to do something else now, because that's gone. And in that, I realized all the sets, props, prosthetics I did for film work, all that went in the trash the day of the shoot or when they wrapped. But the architectural work, comes from a lineage that goes back 4,000 years. Everything I did architecturally was acanthus leaves, uh, fruit and flower swags, plants I'm growing in my garden. Those are living plants, but they're also living symbols that go back 4,000 years. Claiming my part of that process, I can trace that lineage back. 4,000 years, and claiming that, I promised to carry it forward while I am alive. And I never expected my commercial work to merge with my personal work, because the commercial work is an urn with an endless vine on it, which symbolizes the bones of your ancestors and the living vitality of the world as we carry our ancestors forward. My current goals are to live long enough to do work that probably will take me to be 130, you know, which means I have to take really good care of myself to be able to work at full speed. I feel like I'm just getting started. We were going to have to figure out something else for money because it was going to be about our discipline, like it was going to be something, what we could do. But I think we had to separate what we were willing to do for art and what we were willing to do for money. I think that that's the beauty about experimenting, which is what art is. You know, it's an experiment. That was a focus for us, that life experiment, that we were in it up to our, over our heads. And um, it, it was gonna stay that way. 